Prakash Memorial Lecture. I think Dr. Pradeep Sharma will be talking about that. But Prem, Prem Prakash, whoever he touched, he has converted those people into business people. I mean, I'm one of them. So over to the guys, please. Uh, thanks to the local organizing secretary, Dr. Shreya, the secretary general of this OC, Dr. Yogesh Shukla, and of course, our chief guest for this oration, Dr. Michael Brodsky. So this we have the first inaugural Prem Prakash Memorial Lecture. Professor Prem Prakash, as most of us know, he was the pioneer of Strabismus in India. He was the father of Strabismus, the founder president of Strabismological Society of India, which is now known as the uh, Pediatric Ophthalmology Strabismus Society of India. He was a mentor to countless ophthalmology residents and fellows and Strabismologists in the subcontinent. He was born on 8th August 1936, Solan Himachal Pradesh. And uh, his medical and ophthalmic education was done from MBBS from Medical College Amritsar. And then his MS post graduation in Dr. Rajinder Prasad Center for Ophthalmic Science Teams in 1962, where he continued to serve as the faculty. In between, he had gone to Germany for his Christmas training under Professor Kappers the father of pleoptics at Giesen, West Germany, 1968 and 69. His penchant for precision may have seemed petulant to many of the people who uh, assisted him in surgery, but it was probably the German perfectionism which projected on. At RP Center Ames, he developed this Christmas clinic, which has served so many people in our country. He, he was a faculty from 1966 to 1996. He was awarded the Shivaradi oration and that's the, in the right circle, uh, Dr. Pentakash, and all, uh, along with that, it's me. He's had, he was the founder president of SSI, and the first meeting and the second meetings of SSI were conducted by him. Uh, I think we can never forget him. At home, he may have been Papa, but he was PP for us few, and all who delved in squilt saw a father figure in you. The circle of life, life rules on, and we will all, forever remember him. And for his memory, the society has started this oration, which is first time being delivered by a real giant on this planet, professor of ophthalmology and professor of neurology, both from Mayo Clinic, Minnesota, US, Professor Michael Brodsky. Who is this smart young boy? Can you see there is a guitar on the side, but if you don't miss the books in front, you will know it is somebody, a little genius in the making. It's Professor Michael Brodsky when he was a teenager. His journey began in San Francisco. And that's why I think it's been a roller coaster journey through various parts of US, to San Antonio, San Diego, Wayne State University, again, San Francisco, because he has done two fellowships, one in pediatric ophthalmology and one in neuro ophthalmology. He has, now you see the great koala in Australia is having a great company. He may not be knowing that he is sharing the screen with one of the geniuses on this earth. The Brodsky's in Cartagena, a lovely picture of the family you can see here. And with his son Matthew in a trip to Glacier National Park in 2017. But it is not just the physical heights that he has ascended. In the academic world, he has gone far, far beyond. Uh, sometime back, he was honored by the Marshall M. Parks Memorial Lecture. Uh, Senior Achievement Award by American Academy of Ophthalmology, and several awards which are there, which are innumerable. And he has about more than 200 publications. And he has written a book on pediatric neuro-ophthalmology. We talk of uh, things of his interests are evolutionary mechanism of infantile strabismus, congenital optic disc anomalies, ocular motor physiology, nystagmus, DVD skews. Now, these three things are the most troubling for any strabismologist. But this, these are the things in which Professor Borodsky masters. He is recently interested in 3D video oclography and pediatric neuroophthalmology is his great interest. Now, these pictures of the fish, which may be interesting to you, he makes sense out of it. That is the interest part that he makes sense out of these fish, the goldfish in his room, and uh, conveys it in the form of theories which have guided it. Professor Michael Brodsky is the great man in front of us now. And I present to you this man who is now going to deliver the 
Professor Prem Prakash lecture. Professor Prem Prakash may be considered as our Marshall Parks. So he has delivered both Marshall Parks and Pr Prakash Memorial lecture. Uh, over to Professor Michael Brooks. I, I will stop share and uh, you can start scaring. Let's see here. <clears throat> I think it's this one, okay. There we go. Can everybody hear me? Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, yes. I think it well, is, the rest of the people can mute themselves so that. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Sharma. Um, your, your book is always with me and the residents use it on a daily basis and they, they love the pictures and the visual <clears throat> the visual beauty, and I think it's lured several of them uh, here at Mayo into the field of pediatric ophthalmology. I'm deeply honored to inaugurate this lecture in the name of Dr. Prem Prakash, the, fa the father of Indian strabismology. It is a tribute to one of the greats. Dr. Prakash was far ahead of his time, being one of the pioneers in examining ocular motility and psychotic velocity testing in pediatric strabismus, along with many other things such as torsion and A and V patterns. I know that this is a topic he would have enjoyed as it tries to push the boulder forward in our understanding of essential infantile esotropia. Let's see here. Um, for the past 20 years, I've been studying the evolutionary basis of essential infantile esotropia and the unique eye movements that accompany it. And I've come to the conclusion that contrary to po the popular notion that this condition is embedded within the visual cortex, infantile esotropia and its unique ocular motor aberrations are subcortical in origin. So I'd like to take a few minutes to re-examine essential infantile esotropia through the prism of evolution. Um, I'm going to present evidence that infantile esotropia actually arises from a state of extended subcortical neuroplasticity. Let's see, I'm trying to go to the next slide. Um, not sure. There we go. Here's a baby with essential infantile esotropia. What is so amazing about this condition is that, is that both eyes are held in an adducted position, even though the child can fully abduct either eye. So this condition has to be pre-nuclear in origin. But when the child is paralyzed under general anesthesia, the eyes are completely straight. So this condition has to be caused by increased baseline innervation or tonus to the medial rectus muscles and the inferior oblique muscles, which also overact under awake conditions. So it's not like neuroophthalmology where you have paretic <laughs> muscles that underact. Infantile strabismus is a pre-nuclear disorder in which individual extraocular muscles truly overact. Now in neurology, it's considered axiomatic that body movements are innervated by the cerebral cortex, whereas individual muscles are innervated by distinct subcortical centers. So this is where we need to look to get at the crux of the problem. Now the fundamental evolutionary clue to the neurology of infantile esotropia lies in the finding of monocular nasotemporal asymmetry to optokinetic targets. All children with infantile esotropia show a brisk nasal word, show brisk nasal word monocular optokinetic responses and absent or diminished temporal word op monocular optokinetic responses. So as shown in the top two photos, if you cover one eye and then spin the drum nasally in front of the open eye, um, the eye will just will go clickety, clickety, click and move normally. But if you spin the drum temporally, um, 
the response will just fizzle out and the child will be unable to follow the drum. And that's true for either eye. So good nasal word optokinetic responses and wretched temporal word optokinetic responses. We know that monocular nasotemporal asymmetry provides the neurologic substrate for latent nystagmus, wherein covering either eye causes a conjugate nystagmus with a nasal word slow phase and a temporal word refixation saccade for each fixating eye. Even years after successful strabismus surgery, patients with infantile esotropia will always retain their monocular nasotemporal asymmetry. So it serves as a kind of footprint in the snow for infantile esotropia. <laughs> now, what is so interesting is that monocular nasotemporal asymmetry exists in lateral eyed aphoviate animals, and it's used for the detection of full field optokinetic flow. Evolution uses monocular nasotemporal asymmetry to enable the animal to see where it is going during both translational and rotational body movements. So looking at this bottom left figure, think about a fish with two nasal retinas that each see off to one side. When it swims forward, it can't afford to have its eyes driven backward by the temporal word optokinetic input both eyes are receiving. So it doesn't respond to that. And when it turns to one side as shown in the lower right photo, um, it needs to track the visual world that's moving nasally because that's the area that it's turning into. The other eye, uh, the right eye in this example, is seeing a world that the animal's turning away from with visual contours that are at a different distance and therefore moving at different velocities. So that eye can't run the show. So monocular nasal Temporal asymmetry really provides an ingenious evolutionary solution to enable the fish to use optokinetic rotation to visually navigate both translation and rotation. Human infants show monocular nasotemporal asymmetry within the first six months of life. So the persistence of monocular nasotemporal asymmetry in infantile esotropia is an atavism, meaning it's a throwback to an earlier evolutionary form that was lost in succeeding generations, but that somehow reactivates in children with infantile esotropia. Monocular nasotemporal asymmetry is generated by the nucleus of the optic tract, or NOT, and the dorsal terminal nucleus of the accessory optic system. Um, <clears throat> These are subcortical midbrain nuclei that subserve full field visual motion detection. And they're the ones that are involved with horizontal motion detection. And they're normally turned off early in human infancy. So they just don't play into the mature binocular visual system. And that's why we never learn about them. And these subcortical nuclei generate visual vestibular eye movements, meaning that they normally send their visual, visual motion signals to the vestibular nuclei, which rotate the eyes to respond to the optokinetic motion and thereby minimize retinal slip. The subcortical circuitry for optokinetic asymmetry is shared by all vertebrates. <clears throat> Now, when you read about the when you read the comparative biology literature, you're struck by the fact that the unique eye movements that we see in infantile esotropia, latent nystagmus, primary inferior oblique overaction, dissociate vertical deviate, divergence, each correspond to subcortical visual reflexes that are normally operative in lateral eyed animals. And the subcortical pathways for these movements in animals are well established. So it makes sense that the same pathways are involved in generating these movements in humans. In fact, one of the defining features of infantile esotropia is the persistence of these subcortical visual reflexes. So these subcortical pathways are integral to the pathogenesis of essential infantile esotropia. And this is why the neurology of infantile esotropia is conspicuously absent in, neuro in neuro-ophthalmology textbooks. 
to understand it, we have to shine our flashlight into the basement of the brain where the old ancestral subcortical reflexes that normally get put to sleep in infancy remain activated. So this is the power slide. This is the one that we sort of need to um, walk, walk up, um, walk the Himalayas to, to, to gain an understanding. But it's worth taking a few minutes to walk through the neurologic pathways that um, give rise to infantile esotropia. Let me get my pointer going. When you look at this diagram as if looking from the sky, this is the um, left eye and this is the right eye. And the left, um, let me just see. Um, looking from the sky, that would be the right eye. Yeah, this is the, what's that? Yes, this would be the left eye for looking from, I'm, I'm so used to looking at MR images that I, I literally can't, I can't flip the Necker cube in my mind, but this is the left eye. Yeah. So, um, the left eye is receiving nasal word optokinetic input in the form of horizontal motion to the right. And it's the nasal retina in lateral eyed animals and in humans with infantile esotropia that's selectively sensitive to nasal word motion. Now the trouble um, with our understanding of infantile esotropia is that we've put our magnifying glass on this part of the brain, which is the visual cortex. And we've assumed that there must be a primary defect in binocular vision, which then caused the eyes to cross, when actually it's more likely that the primary problem is in this part, in the subcortical visual pathways. So let, let's now try to examine the sub, these subterranean visual pathways that have so far eluded us in the field of neuroophthalmology. Because the entire fish retina is, na is nasal retina, it only sees off temporally into the temporal vision field. The motion signal crosses entirely in the optic chiasm and goes to the contralateral nucleus of the optic tract and dorsal terminal nucleus of the accessory optic system, which are these midbrain nuclei that are selectively sensitive to rightward motion. These subcortical nuclei process horizontal motion input and then they send their signal down to the dorsal cap of the inferior olive in the medulla and then down to the cerebellar flocculus which processes visual vestibular input, visual motion input. The cerebellar flocculus then sends its output signal to the vestibular nucleus which integrates visual optokinetic motion from the two eyes with vestibular motion from the two labyrinths, head motion, and then sends its final output signal to the ocular motor nuclei and then to the extraocular muscles to minimize retinal slip. So this is our subcortical visual vestibular roadmap. And as we will see, this ancestral circuitry in the basement of the brain controls visual motion detection in lateral eyed animals. And it also generates infantile esotropia in humans. Now, what normally happens in the visual cortex is that binocular magnocellular pathways in MTMST, which is the visual motion center of the cortex, don't start to function until two to three months of age. And then they mature further until six months of age. And then they establish their motion connections down from the cortex to the NOTDTN, nucleus of the optic tract, dorsal terminal nucleus, to subserve um, full field, to, uh, to subserve, um, um, foveal pursuit. So um, when they establish their cortical motion connections, they come down, connect straight from MST to NOT, DTN, to uh, ipsilaterally, and then they run the show through the visual cortex. And since the cortex is involved in foveal pursuit, now it's no longer 
six-month-old infants no longer rely on full field optokinetic responses. They can respond to foveal targets. So you have this early retinotectal pathway in the first three months of life in normal infants that connects straight from the retina to the NOTDTN to subserve full field optokinetic motion. But then you have developed binocular cortical motion pathways that subserve foveal pursuit. And they connect again down to the NOTDTN at the same time the subcortical pathways get permanently turned off. But according to the Hoffman hypothesis, when binocular vision is preempted, no binocular corticotectal connections are established because there's no binocular cells in V1. And because according to the Hebbian hypothesis, neurons that wire together fire together, it turns out that only the crossed cortical pathways um, from the nasal retina of, of the opposite eye can stream through the visual cortex and hook up to the NOTDTN because these are the pathways that have the same motion sense, rightward motion sensitivity as the NOTDTN. So you get a visual motion cortex that is secondarily wired up to match the directionality of the pre-existing subcortical visual pathways. And now you end up with monocular nasotemporal asymmetry that's driven through the visual cortex. And that's why we see monocular nasotemporal asymmetry in clinic when we spin the optokinetic drum and they're following foveal targets. Now, because monocular nasotemporal asymmetry and cortical motion asymmetries have been detected electrophysiologically within the visual cortex of patients with infantile esotropia, some have inferred that essential infantile esotropia must be caused by a primary problem within the visual cortex. But really, these findings are exactly what you would expect to see if the cortical foveal pursuit pathways secondarily reconfigured themselves to match the pre existing subcortical template with its directional asymmetry for, for full field optokinetic responses. So although you can find monocular nasotemporal asymmetry within the motion pathways of the visual co cortex, this is the effect rather than the cause of the problem. And the primary cause lies within the subcortical visual motion circuitry. And I think that this has been the critical oversight in the cortical model for infantile esotropia. Infantile esotropia does not require a primary cortical defect in binocular vision. And indeed, there's no evidence that one exists. So how does this all fit together? We all learned in medical school that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. And this is really true for the uh, developing visual system. In humans, the subcortical optokinetic system is operational within the first two to three months of infant life until cortical binocular vision develops. And that's why a newborn baby won't follow a pen light, but will show optokinetic responses to a full field surround even on day one of life. As our cortical motion pathways mature, our subcortical visual motion system loses its plasticity and gets shut down forever. But there's no evidence that the cortical pathways actively turn off the subcortical pathways. You might think that would be the way it would work in a, in a sane world. But in fact, the subcortical visual pathways seem to lose their plasticity and shut down at two to three months of age, even when the cortical motion pathways never develop. Now we know that infantile esotropia develops gradually during this critical period when the subcortical motion pathways are normally extinguished. So here's the question, could retained subcortical neuroplasticity lead to persistence of simultaneous subcortical optokinetic input from both retinas and gradually drive the eyes into a frontal, and gradually drive both frontally placed eyes into an esotropic position? Well, the answer in lower animals is definitely yes. Colowine has shown in rabbits, um, this has shown this effect in rabbits 
and more recently it's been shown in zebrafish. And I just want you to, to play you a video to show how strong this optokinetic response is in zebrafish. And remember, zebra, zebrafish don't have a visual cortex, so this is all being driven subcortically. So I'm gonna show you disjunctive optokinetic input to both eyes, first temporal, re temporal word retinal input to both eyes, then nasal word retinal input to both eyes, and let's see what happens to the eye position. Temporal word, the eyes go a little exo. Nasal word, the eyes go ESO, little flick of the tail there. Let's look one more time. Temporal word. Here we go. Temporal word, XO. Fast phase refixation, nasal word, ESO, slow tonic ESO movement. The response by the tail. Now, at the cortical level, think about this. The nasal retina of the esodeviated eye is always suppressed, as shown by this gray area. Th this eye is looking straight at the target, and this eye is turned in relative to the target, and the nasal retina is suppressed, and that's why children with infantile esotropia don't have double vision. So the two eyes at a cortical level cannot generate simultaneous nasal word optokinetic responses, but at the subcortical level, there's no suppression. So both eyes can be pulled in simultaneously, just like in fish and in rabbits. In other words, you can have cortical suppression in one eye and still have the two subcortical nuclei that are hyper-functioning because they're being stimulated at a completely different level. And the beauty of this mechanism is that the subcortical optokinetic system can remain operational despite cortical suppression of the esodeviated eye. So in conclusion, infantile esotropia conforms to a state of extended subcortical neuroplasticity in which the subcortical visual pathways fail to shut down in the third month of life as they normally do allowing an early subcortical nasal word optokinetic bias to simultaneously drive each eye into an esotropic position. Accordingly, infantile esotropia is not a broken system, as many people think. It doesn't require a neurologic lesion. It's not a soft sign of neurologic disease. It's an older ancestral system that retains its function so that you get innervational overaction of specific extraocular muscles. The supreme irony of this subcortical mechanism is that as the visual cortex becomes monocular in infantile esotropia, you're either looking with your right eye or your left eye, the subcortical system, visual system becomes binocular, meaning that both nasal retinas are simultaneously activated at the subcortical level to drive the eyes inward. So I've come to view infant, essential infantile esotropia as an evolutionary footprint. It's like the two nasal retinas are, um, are repositioned, it's like the two nasal retinas, meaning my thumbs, are repositioned into the frontal plane in humans but that they continue to do the same thing that they did in lateral eyed animals. And if you think about it, this actually solves a problem if there's no binocularity by restoring horizontal optokinetic bidirectionality in children with infantile esotropia. So whichever way horizontal direction an object is moving, the child can follow it with the eye that is receiving nasal word input and just switch eyes if it switches direction. And we've recently reported spontaneous fixation switch induced solely by directional reversal of horizontal optokinetic motion in children with infantile esotropia. I'll end with a quote from William Harvey, the physiologist who almost 500 years ago used comprehensive, used comparative biology to to study and define the human circulatory system. He presciently noted, nature herself 
must be our advisor. The path she chalks must be our walk. For as long as we confer with our own eyes and make ascent from lesser things to higher, we shall at last be received into her closet of secrets. Thank you very much for the honor of delivering this lecture. Um, it really, um, it, it, it's the only good thing that I have, that, that um, I have going this, this um, December where, where COVID has sort of grounded everybody from travel. And so um, I was really looking forward to giving, giving it and to being a part of this wonderful symposium. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Brodisky. Um, you have really, you know, highlighted the, the basic thing uh, of the, uh, you know, the, the, the infantile isotropia where the neurological system. I have just one question to ask you. Can I ask you a question? Yes, please. Uh, you said about the empty area, that is the mid-temporal area, which initially drives the path up to first three months and then the it... Um, uh, you know, disappears and then uh, the visual the visual cortex takes over. But in later ages, uh, it has been reported that if the visual cortex is destroyed because of the trauma, again, the empty area has the plasticity to develop. What do you think neurologically? Because the motion... Yeah. Do you mean the NOTDTN? Um, so... The empty so, area still can function even if the patient is cortically blinded of the visual cortex V1 area. And then the empty area again takes takes over, which initially was taking before the three months of age. Uh, I see. I think that, that ref the empty area of the cortical pursuit pathway, yeah, yes, I think... I think that has, has refers to the phenomenon of blind sight if I understand your question directly, wherein you can have what appears to be complete loss of the visual cortex, yet yeah. they can still show some some evidence of, of visual responses and, and being able to predict which direction an object is moving. Exactly. And that's always a very nebulous area, but but there are enough studies that have confirmed its existence. But you're never completely sure whether the cortex is completely destroyed, but usually it's destroyed to a sufficient degree that you know it couldn't be producing the responses that you see. Yeah, that's, that's. but it seems that once the subcortical visual pathways, the NOTDTN get turned off at th two to three months of age, they don't recover, they don't turn back on. There's a period of plasticity and if you lose that, they're unrecoverable. So what seems to happen in strabismus is they don't get turned off like they normally should. And the question is why, and we'll just have to see. You know, it's a very, very difficult area to study in terms of, um, in terms of what, what is changing its neuroplasticity, you know. Thank you, Dr. Brodsky, I think, for sharing your path-breaking research and taking us back to the roots to get the answers for which we did not know anything. Many times when our patients ask, why do I have infantile isotropia and we have no answers? I think your research is definitely going to lead us to get those answers which we have not had since ages. Uh, I'll hand it over to Dr. Sudarshan Khoker to present uh, Memento. Yeah, uh, and, uh, this is the... Uh, this is the uh, oration certificate uh, we have prepared for you, uh, Dr. Brodisky, and hopefully uh, we will able to you know post this to you, uh, and uh, because we can't, can't give it to you personally, but we'll try to post it to you. Now I request Dr. Yeah. Now I request Dr. Coker to please read out the oration certificate. It's an honor to read it out now. The Strabismus and Pediatric Ophthalmology Society of India, SPOSI confers the Prem Prakash Oration Award to Professor Brodinsky, Michael Brodinsky, USA. And uh, with a wonderful talk you're given, I think uh, uh, everybody is enlightened. I yeah, think please read out, please read out the whole certificate. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, he talked about the newer uh, perspectives on essential isotropia, which as he already said, and delivered it on the seventh annual SPOSI virtual conference in December, 2020. This is an honor bestowed upon him 
for ex exemplary services rendered in the field of strabismus, pediatric ophthalmology, uh, signed by Sudarshan Khokhar, the president, and uh, Yogi Shukla, the secretary oh, of uh, Exposi. Now that's complete. Now what, what I like to say is that I think everybody should pick up a bowl mm -hmm. and put some goldfish in that and put them in your in your mm -hmm. OR, in, in your uh, opening room so that <laughs> every time you see that, you might click and get something new. Thank you very much, Dr. Brodsky. It was a fantastic eye-opener for everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Sir, uh, there is uh, one memento from local organizing committee to Dr. Pradeski, sir. So I request Dr. Mehul also to present the memento to him. Later on, we'll definitely courier it, but we can show you here. Uh, I hope it's not a fish bowl. Huh? <laughs> this, this is some. Dr. Mehul is the yes, yes. Dr. Shreya, and he's also one of the uh, persons who is organizing this conference from Nahul. You mean the big fish, huh? Yeah, Dr. Mehul is coming here. This is a memento. It is a showpiece. It's not only showpiece, it says show it, show it. Eyes. Zoom in, zoom in. Zoom in. 2020. Yeah, it's ivory. It's oh. it says 2020, straight 2020 with two eyes, and you can open. <laughs> and use it like this. And behind this is... Oh, that is wonderful. That is beautiful. Thank you so much. And I request Dr. Mehul to offer a stall. It's a typical Gujarati woven stall. It's something from our area. Oh, look at that. That is, that is splendid, wow. May, may, do, do I need to wear that during the next meeting when I come to India? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. We'll be happy to see you wearing this. <laughs> Once you wear it from there itself. <laughs> Let's hope it happens sooner than later. It will. It we will. Hope, yeah. We hope to see you here with that stall. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. That's very thank generous so and much. kind. Thank you once again, Dr. Brodsky. It was really splendid of you to be giving us this great talk. And our juniors and our all of us are going to be uh, learning from it. And I think we'll be seeing the answers soon for us. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Take thank care, you, everybody. Brodsky. Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, we hope to, it's a, it's, a, it's a standing invitation to you to come for next year in the physical conference, please. Well, just watch for me by the window. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Take care. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Well, give him a big hand, please, everybody. And uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Michael Brodsky. Have a good evening to me and a good morning to you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, take care. Yes. Bye bye. I hope that you stay with us for some time more. We have some sessions. Oh, okay. I'll stay on for a little while. <laughs>